Hello, it is Saturday, May 8th, 2021. This is uh, the Yormish workout experiment. That seems like a fun word for it. Um, cycle seven, chapter three, iteration five. So, all right, so what is it? Upper body part two. Chapter three means it's the Monday, Wednesday, Friday thing, only it's Saturday, not Friday. And uh, going through it, five exercises. Just gonna go through the five exercises. First, some stretching and some breathing. Then the five exercises are incline press, chest machine or flat bench, Lat pull, lat push downs. That's standing up lat push downs, hammer curls, and then bent over flies. Okay, so still feeling it. Yeah, I'm not gonna talk too much about what it is, but the bottom line is yeah, I can't even say. <laughs> No, I'm not going to, even though I'm home alone, I got this on and I'm going to keep my composure. But yeah, people making poor choices, very poor choices, you know, making a permanent solution to temporary problems in a very bad way. That's about as far as I'll go with that, but that's still running through my emotional well-being and the objective side of myself the observer the the stuff i can take myself out of my head is i wonder how it's going to affect uh my performance in this but i've also wrote written down smaller numbers because i want to try something i need some variety i need something to think about i need something to stir the hamster wheel of my mind and what that thing is is going a little bit deeper into breathing and uh it's almost like there's four phases of breath, but we won't talk about that until we get the public service announcement out of the way. So, wow, two minutes of talking before we got that. I'll try to get there within 30 seconds next time. Seems like that would be an appropriate amount, so I apologize for that. But here we are. Public service announcement. Please, pretty please, do not waste your time watching this video unless you have a very... Specific reason to watch this video. If it's some sort of self-induced punishment that you're giving yourself, all I can say is there's a way to watch this video faster. There might be a tab somewhere or three dots or a gear looking thing that lets you deal with playback speed. And uh, hopefully you'll watch this as fast as possible if you're forcing yourself to watch this. Just saying. So I can bake you a cake with a file in it or something get you out of your self-induced purgatory why you would do that to yourself i don't know but just maybe there's somebody out there that's like i'm gonna force myself to watch terrible things with the notepad and take notes and then i'm gonna use that towards well number one there's a lot better videos out there so with way better instruction and way better explanations but for whatever reason Oh, also, here's a fun fact. Um, on the 25th of this month, it'll be 1,000 days. I'm going to stop counting, but 1,000 days since I said to myself, wow, my knees are getting goofy. I can't go on a run with my friend when he comes down. And it's been two years or all he's come down, and I haven't gone with on a little run or jog with him. And we used to jog and run and all that kind of stuff all the time. So I felt bad about that. Almost a thousand days ago, and I made a decision to, using his advice, lighten down a little weight, try to make myself in every day focus a little bit on uh, being more active and being a little bit healthier and working out more and all that kind of stuff. A thousand days of uh, consistently being healthier and working out. I don't think um, if someone told me I would be in the shape I'm in right now, I would be like, wow, I'm a lazy guy. Um, that, that's not good enough for a thousand days. That's not, like I said, it's not quite a thousand days. We're 
you know, we're about 20 days away from 1,000, so it's about 980, somewhere in there. But that's not the point. The point is it's not 1,000 days and done. It's, a you know, the lifestyle choice, the identity. I am a person that's choosing to work out consistently and do things for my health consistently and intermittent fast and all that kind of good stuff, even though lately uh, I've just been eating like a sad man <laughs> and uh more than one reason for that and well actually just one big reason and me dealing with myself you only have so much willpower i guess and sometimes it, it all breaks somewhere i guess but i'll get back on the i'll get back on the horse eventually i will use one of my friends proven tactics a little bit over a long time equals a lot of momentum in the long time. He It worked really well for him in some instances. It didn't work well for him in all instances. But just because it doesn't work with everything doesn't mean to throw out the principle. And uh, we talked about that principle, and he showed me his way of doing it. And his way was pretty awesome. It was a way he knew himself and the way he did. And he... Uh, he went over some hurdles that uh, I didn't think he was going to get over. But through a combination of various marks of his character, what would be a good word for it? Conviction within his character, conviction deep within his identity. He faced some of his challenges, and some of them he succeeded against. Not all of them. And uh, that's why he's uh, not here today. Not physically here. He wouldn't. He doesn't show up for my workouts, and I wouldn't want him to. But not even having that as a remote possibility. But like I said, I'm not going to think too much about that, other than just be the observer in my own head and just observe. Hey, this person that I'm observing, me, has gone through. A, let's just say a, a little bit more than a little bit of uh, some emotional trauma and uh, there's a grieving process going on and does he stick to his guns? No, no, he's, he's failed at a few things but is he trying? Yes. Has he succeeded in some of the hurdles he set for himself? Yes, absolutely. Has he gotten some important things done? Absolutely. Has he gotten it all done? Has he done all the important things? Well, he never does anyway, even in his best state. <laughs> Never accomplishes all his goals. So, no. But, hey, every day gets a little bit closer. And it's not about what my friend taught me is something he said a lot. It's not about perfection. It's about progress. Practice equals progress. Anyway, so I'm going to go through. Yeah, I already said these these things. But basically, going to do a little bit different as far as like the reverse pyramid training going to focus on the breath and imagine you will there's four stages of breath there is the inhale well we'll start out with the exhale we'll exhale then there is the holding empty or close to empty then there is the inhale then there is the holding of the breath when it was near full never can really be fully empty really difficult to do and really can never be fully full really difficult to do and I'm not shooting for progression, uh, for perfection, just a little bit of progress. So that's my goal. Each repetition coincides with one of those four phases of breath. So I'll start out with an exhale. That's a repetition. I'll hold almost empty. That's a repetition. I will inhale. That's a repetition. And then I will hold almost full and do a repetition of whatever exercise. So basically, these exercises are going to be renumbered into sets of four. So it'll be like eight reps and then like 12 reps and 16 reps and all that kind of stuff. So basically stick, sticking within that, that framework of the four phases of breath. That's what I'm doing today, uh, which will lead into Adventure Week, where I'm going to apply that to all sorts of exercises in Adventure Week. One thing I've discovered is... You're only, as we, you're only as strong as the weakest link in the chain. And uh, I'm applying that principle to the breathing thing. For example, when I do pull-ups, 
I'd do a cycle of four pull-ups. That last pull-up is the hardest, not only because it's the last one, but also I'm doing that last cycle of pull-up holding full after just that third. Number three is the inhale. So there's two reasons why that, that fourth one's kind of hard. And I sometimes break on that fourth one and exhale while I'm doing, you know, through the repetition. I just did that and I found that out and I was like, wow, okay. And I asked myself, is it just the fact that it was number four and it's, you know, difficult, the, you know, two is going to be harder than uh, one and, and three is going to be harder than two and four is going to be harder than three and all that kind of stuff. Just the stacking of resistance. But I think it was something a little bit beyond that. So, and uh, I think different exercises, different muscles react different ways to the four phases of breath. Obviously... There's going to be one phase that's weaker for whatever muscle group, uh, depending upon that. Do I know which phase? I'm going to guess that the weakest phase is probably holding full, um, but I don't know. Uh, that's just going to be my guess based upon anecdotal evidence, and maybe for different uh, exercises, it'll be different things. So that's kind of cool, breaking new territory, blocking things up. Also, uh, I'm going to try to do all this three through through nose breathing and I'm not going to be counting out loud. Counting out loud sometimes screws up my breath. Uh, just a minor speed bump, but it's a fragile term right now. And uh, even minor speed bumps get me to go uh, distinctly off course. So I'm going to try to do all nose breaths. I'm not going to go try to do terribly deep, but I'm going to try to go a little bit slower. If I go a little bit slower, Obviously, I've known that going a little bit slower with lifting anything, you want to kind of lift a little less. So I'm lifting a little less. And uh, in some cases, I guess maybe a lot less. But that's okay. Because even when I've noticed when I've done a little less or a lot less doing slow, I still really feel it. Um, and I think it also helps to the quality of the repetitions. It gets rid of some of the momentum. As long as I don't go glacially slow. I'm not going to go for the like the... Uh, the seven second, uh, you know, uh, eccentric phase and the six second uh, concentric phase. I'm just not that advanced, to tell you the truth. Um, I've tried it before and it's hard to keep track of it. And not only keeping track of that and keeping track of my breath and also having trying to have that meaningful dialogue, the subjective dialogue between my, my body and my mind or my body and my soul or whatever's going on there. So... A little bit esoteric, a little bit of subjective reality, a little bit of mental games that we play with numbers and all that kind of stuff. I know some people that do uh, uh, the mental game for them to do, let's say, 50 push-ups is they count to 25, and then they get, once they get to 25, they count down from 25. And unless they do that, they're not hitting their number. So it's really weird, the mental game that people play, um, which is kind of awesome. Once you know your mental games, you can push your own buttons, you can control, uh, you can become the person you want to be you don't have to necessarily be controlled by uh people that may not have the the best intentions for you so but that's another story that's another subject that's not even a story just as a whole subject i was thinking about pushing buttons people that can trigger you and if you can be triggered you can be controlled not a hundred percent controlled but controlled in certain ways so be very careful as I was telling a friend recently, sometimes you kind of want to build a, a bulletproof suit as opposed to a nice and shiny, beautiful dress, let's say, or whatever. I don't really, I don't wear dresses, but um, I, some people do, and, and dresses are probably one of the most beautiful garments out there. I suppose for me, I don't really, I'm not really into beautiful garments. Form equals function, and, you know, all of it goes in the wash anyway, and, uh, you know, one color all by itself you know what, it'll, it'll, it won't splash into the other stuff. And I, I don't have to separate my laundry and, and, and do taxing things that I'm just not going to do. So yeah, wearing just one simple, yeah, I got like five of the same pairs of shorts, uh, three of one type of shirt, two of another type of shirt. Uh, I have a lot of other clothes, but those are the ones I wear <laughs> just, just those. Um, and I got a suit somewhere too. I gotta, I gotta dig that up, but anyhow, so this, uh, yeah, this is getting put down. Undo? No. Cancel the undo. I didn't want to hit any undos. Yeah, I'm 
diary of the mouth and all that kind of stuff. I'm trying to get as much of it out now before I work out so I'm not tempted to talk while working out because I'm going to try to find practice of zipping my lips. Kind of want to get better at nose breathing too. And I'm almost thinking about getting a hold of some medical tape and while I sleep, put the medical tape over my mouth. And, uh, you know, because medical tape, it doesn't really, you know, it doesn't really bug you. It could stay on skin for a good while, you know, eight hours or, or maybe even more uh, without much of a problem. No real sticky residue, but easy to wash. It's not going to get caught up all in the beard. I'm going to do so, small pieces of it. And if I really need to breathe through my mouth, I want to be able to subconsciously tear it off. You know, I, I don't need to, you know, want to have a knife or scissors or whatever. You know, I'm not going to super glue my lips together. But uh, I think a little thing like that might help me breathe a little bit more through my nose. Because uh, I noticed the volume of air. Well, I, I, breathing through my nose actually helps me breathe a little bit slower anyway. And I'm guessing slower breaths. I'm... I, I, I'm Total, don't have knowledge, not an expert in this, but playing around with the idea of breathing slower versus faster, they all have their uses, but habituation, I think in the log haul, consistency over intensity, rather breathe slower and have even my, my breath reflect, excuse me, this idea of consistency over intensity. So playing around with all these things. First exercise is the incline bench. Wow, I've talked for almost 17 minutes. That is amazing. And what's equally amazing is if anybody paid attention to anybody, any of that out there. Personally, I hope if you're one of the, it, I don't even know if you exist, I, whatever. If you're a, a person that needs to watch this for whatever reason, self-punishment. Um, hey. <laughs> You know, hopefully you're doing this fast and this is only taking up, you know, <laughs> a little over eight minutes of your time. Yeah. But it'll take more than that because I'm going. So first thing I'm going to do is stretch out a little bit and uh, apply some of that breathing to the stretching. I'm going to do a cycle of the four, which is one cycle. Cool.
Is it? That is interesting. Sometimes at the end of an exercise, one would default to mouth breathing. And I guess that has its uses. Feels like, hey, I want more air and a different flavor or something. I don't know. Maybe I want the taste of my toothpaste. Who knows? So yeah, good stuff. I had to change a few numbers on that. Using that, the, the heavier weight or the larger weight, the specifically physically larger weight for the bent over flies, it felt awkward and clumsy. So I switched it out and I just did, I think four sets of eight. And the first set was a set of 16. But the four sets of eight were with lower weight, which was fine because it still felt pretty good. The biggest challenge at that point was just the breathing, getting the breathing right, locking into it. But I was having practice with it. And the practice is making it almost a little bit automatic. So there's some good stuff going on there. Gonna sit down and do those little leg stretches that like can start out with those and we'll talk about all sorts of silliness but yeah not bad for a tiny workout that might have been just 20 minutes shoot if I, might have been just 16 minutes holy cow but I am definitely feeling it especially adding that breath component there's blood flow and strong powerful heartbeats sped up I really noticed that near the end, just really trying to focus on my heart and let it beat and let it, feeling that blood flow and just like, let's get that blood everywhere. Let's get it all through that body, my body, and make it feel good. I guess I'll do this little stretch for a little bit, just widen things up there. And then there's kind of like that thing, just grabbing as high as I can grab. <sighs> feels bizarre but it's good and we'll go back into this one of the things I'm so sad about my buddy that died oh man I've lost uh, some good friends in this life but one day we're stretching before a, like a practice type thing and uh, <laughs> I did I did this kind of stretch and see that's uh, actually I, I tried to do like some Wim Hof type things and he watched some of the Wim Hof type the Wim Hof actual real Wim Hof videos he got a hold of some of those and he watched some of them and one of the stretches was this stretch I probably got it from that somewhere and turning backwards and I was doing that before practice and I wanted to do like specifically all sorts of breathing exercises with him and he basically said the stretching is why I, I can't do that and I'm like listen the stretching is just the cherry on top of the exercises the most important thing the bare minimum is just the breathing exercises stretching not required if you did just the stretching or if you did just the breathing, you know, you can live without the stretching. You can live without doing the exercises, quite, quite frankly, but your life would be better with doing it. I'm gonna do that a little bit deeper, a little bit further into it, but while, while thinking about him in that situation and all my breathing stuff and all that, he thought was probably just some silly woo-woo stuff. And it very well might be, I could be entirely wrong about it until he's really started trying it. And then, with a, a lot of social leverage. I'm like, you, you, you think I'm of sound mind sometimes. So, hey, go with me on this journey. I was, I'm trying to do a, a specific type of breathing exercise every day. I, I almost wanted to do it with him over the phone, but no, that never happened. But I did get him to do it for a week or two. And he told me he got the most amazing results, hearing colors and seeing sounds and then falling asleep instantly and 
just these really amazing good feelings. He got all this good stuff. And then he stops after the second week. I'm like, oh my goodness, I don't get any of that. I, I feel okay, I feel different, but I don't feel amazing like that. And I'm like, why'd you quit? <laughs> Apparently, um, the cost of entry to get there is 30 minutes or however long of breathing. And it, sure, it makes you feel amazing, but you can feel pretty good in 20 seconds by just starting a drink or something like that. So that was sometimes the path he took. And I already have my own associations with that. And uh, I try to be very fair and balanced when it comes to people and alcohol. But it's like the more I care about somebody, the less I like to see them caught in that trap. If, it's, if I believe it's honestly affecting their, their life in a negative way. And I certainly believe it affected his life in a very negative way. Matter of, that, matter of fact, well, I won't get into that. And like I said, I, I gotta stay away from my own preconceived notions about certain things. And, and, and especially, you know, speculation and talking about things I really don't fully know about. I can put ideas that make sense forth, but as long as I say, well, I really don't know about this, but it seems like trying to get better with that whole thing because in his situation, there's a whole bunch it seems like, but you know, I could be a thousand percent surprised and be a hundred percent wrong and all sorts of that. And whether I'm right or wrong, it doesn't change the end result. So yeah. <clears throat> and before I start caving into whatever feeling I'm feeling now, I'm not gonna try to stop it. I'm just going to <clears throat> control my reaction to it. The feeling can do whatever it wants right now. Feel free. Sometimes things like grief so weird. I don't know if what I just did makes sense, but I felt some grief and it was wanting to hit me hard and I knew it. And sometimes it sneaks past me, especially when I'm alone. I feel like my, uh, I won't say guard or defense or I will say awareness of grief is not nearly as good right now than with when another human being is around. But what happened just now was that grief came in. And I said to the grief, go wherever you want. And it made a home in my breath. Maybe because I was thinking so much about breathing, obviously. I mean, but it was interesting to see that it, me, I'm part of my grief, the situation is part of my grief, was making a home in that breath and getting cozy within that. And there was something. And it wasn't like somebody saying, it's okay, it's okay, because it's not. But it was when somebody says, it's okay, it's okay, when the situation's not, what that person's, if that person's trying to say something beyond that, maybe I hope it's okay, or I don't know, but there's something that I, I don't have the words for that came in with that feeling. You know, you can be at home in my breath if you want to. You know, telling my own grief that. And this is all weirdly subjective. And not really the kind of subjective I usually plan out for. I mean, emotions and motivations and all that kind of stuff is highly subjective. You know, it's kind of funny. Sometimes I catch myself doing something and I ask myself, why do I do that? And it's so amazingly fast how quick I can come up with some of reasoning for it. And that reason could be complete fabrication, I guess. And it's just like, wow. I guess I need to hold on to the narrative so much I'm gonna just make something up, I'm gonna possibly lie to myself. 
thank goodness I realized I've done that a few times, but I'm scared of, kind of scared of all the times I didn't realize I was lying to myself about something. And I think there's been situations in my life where I've certainly lied to myself about something. You know, those situations where it's like, it's going to be okay, it's going to be okay. And then there's part of you know that, like, yeah, there's a distinct possibility this is not going to be okay. And uh, both of those things actually do have their uses. If I need to turn up my awareness, saying this may not be okay, turns up the awareness. If the awareness is too dialed in, and not is going to distract me from proper action, then there's a good chance this is going to be okay. And good chance, I don't mean by percent, percentage-wise, even though it sounds like that. I mean, like, a lot of these chances, some of them, the chances are actually good. Some of the chances are actually bad. You know, so even if you have a six-sided die and the one and the two are the good things or just the one if if anything else uh but a one rolls up something bad happens but the one is the good chance so at least there is a good chance the chances aren't good <laughs> but there is a good chance within the realm of possibilities which is kind of it's small little words when you say them to yourself make you feel better even though you know the whole packet of meaning behind it and if you are have a knee-jerk reaction to lying to yourself playing with that level of subjective reality seems interesting I don't know where I'm going with this I'm going into another stretch. That's what I'm doing. And the other side of that same thing I did way back when. And honestly, maybe right now, there's a good chance he's doing a stretch like this effortlessly without a body racked in pain. And he doesn't have to be envious of me. He doesn't, maybe he even sees this stretch right now and he's like, I can do that and bend my head all the way around 180 degrees. Check this out. Oh, you can't see me. You know, that kind of thing. Who knows? And that is the realm of subjective reality right there. Who knows? But I do want to take this moment and be very thankful to him and other friends and people that have graced my life for the lessons, the fun times, even some of the bad times, the growth that came along with it, the experience of life itself. kind of challenges you can get excited for <laughs> playing a brand new song playing an old song in an old way playing an old song that you know really well and you want to share it with a handful of people and see and hope that they get some good some of the the tasty goodness that you got from it you know that sharing There's an excitement and an evolution and sometimes a refinement to certain creative endeavors. And I am so thankful that I had someone, I had the journey I had with someone that had a great deal of integrity towards certain aspects of that creative journey. And also the weird thing was that some of the integrity 
was based in a loss of integrity, uh, based into this idea of dissonance and panic and intensity and, and giving a vision to the wild horse before you tame it. I don't know. Maybe that's totally off on some of the things. A lot of good memories out there. I once had a cat. Her name was Winx. I once had a bandmate. His name was Red. And I remember him and I, she was always afraid of other people. Most people that came into this place came into my house. And I remember some people wanted to kind of chase after and that scared her more because they thought, oh, she's so cute. She wants to be my friend. And really, she was really scared and they couldn't find her wherever she hid. And I never gave away her hiding places and I didn't even know all of her hiding places. And then there was one day where he showed up and we were going to play music and I lost her a little over two years ago, but, you know, this has been months in coming, maybe a year in coming. And uh, she came out. She, he's been coming over here for a while. All right. He's cool. And she just, uh, we were playing loud, real loud music. And a, a little scared thing like her. I mean, sometimes I played loud by myself, so... You know, she was probably already used to the loudness. The loudness didn't equal something to be scared of to her, possibly. I don't know what her thought process was, but she came in, listened, sat like a very proper lady, very prim and proper sometimes, observed, watched around, walked over to me, but I'm flailing and moving about and all that kind of stuff. She doesn't want to get too close to those uh, drum pedals and stuff. Went over to him saw him he smiled down on her and we kept singing and all that and she kept hanging out and it was like okay that moment i felt pretty good about two entities two thinking entities in my life and myself as being an entity that observes them i almost said two people in my life getting along you know because you're never sure about that. And you're going to be okay with like, hey, if they don't get along, they don't get along. Not everybody gets along. But it was nice to see that. Especially the beginning of that. That okayness. Yeah, that was a beautiful day. Wish I could remember all of it a little bit better, but there's uh, quite a few snapshots in there. And once I start digging into that memory... A couple more pop up and it's it's a whole roller coaster of good stuff and yeah as soon as I say good stuff yeah some bad stuff pops open too but lots of good stuff and just like you can never relive the same day again you can make days very similar you can make good times very similar and why wouldn't you hopefully that's part of the human condition but those moments, going back to those, and yes, for anyone that knows me and knows I've talked entirely too much about the idea of 
this grief equation I have in the realm of subjective reality and how to deal with grief and my way of dealing with it, which I don't think it works for very many people. I hope it does. It would be so cool if I had this technique that would work for a whole bunch of people and make the world a better place. But honestly, <laughs> uh, I, I don't think it's going to work for very many people. But having that grief equation and applying it and all the grief equation, the simplest version is as bad as you're feeling in that worst moment of grief or in a big moment of grief, you tack on all these good memories and you add up how good you were feeling in those good memories. And if it's at least three times better than the, the bad feeling, the good memories are three times better overall than the, the bad feeling, then maybe that's winning at life. I wish there was a better way I can determine it and not use the phrase winning at life, but there's probably a far more elegant phrase. Right now, that's the closest words I have to express that situation. Doing the grief equation consistently over and over again. As soon as I feel that grief, I uh, knee-jerk reaction, go right into that grief equation. And I can feel some of the happiness from those memories. The happiness is stronger. I'm also very lucky to have people that are still alive in my life. <laughs> Hopefully some of you know who you are. Maybe some of you don't. I don't know. Hopefully none of you are watching this. Well, I know there's at least one that probably is, so. Sorry to make this too long for you. But. Thank you. Yeah, there's still good in the world. There's still good people. There's still, life goes on. I remember one of the first times I dealt with uh, some form of grief. I didn't understand it in the beginning. And I wondered how everybody could still, how there still could be cars on the road. Like, a, I was a dumb little kid. But like, with my limited knowledge, that made sense. How could people still be going to work? And how could people still have cars on the roads? And how could all this be going on? I know that person knows and they're not doing anything different. And instead of getting mad about that, realizing just the existence of life is resilient and life goes on. And there's something beautiful about that. It's something beautiful if I engage in risky behavior and those risks catch up with me and I die. Then life goes on for the people I care about. Hopefully it doesn't stop them. Hopefully maybe they know me enough to know the grief equation and maybe they apply it to me and me figuring out something and putting it together and hopefully making it make sense, add some sense and some value to their life that helps with this whole churning thing that we call life. Keep going on and having that choice to, in certain moments, going on for the better the good, the good feelings, the quality challenges. I'll even talk about that towards lifting weights or resistance training or running or whatever or swimming and all those kind of things. Heck, even sometimes a cold shower. You know, these, these challenges that we like because they're not too difficult. Sometimes I try to lift a little too much and Honestly, there's probably a little bit of ego in there. Hopefully I'm a person with nothing to prove. And I try to be a person with nothing to prove. But occasionally, every now and then, there's something. 
And thank goodness I keep the camera off during those somethings. But, and they'll still be there. I, I know that it's there. But if there's too much of those somethings, if there's too much of the challenge is too difficult or too intense, um, the kind of challenge that makes you quake in the boot, in your boots the next time you're facing it. You know, I think a little bit of that is necessary for me at least. Not necessary, but good. A little bit, not too much. But sometimes I, I put a little bit too much of that seasoning on. And then I don't want to work out as much. I don't like those associations. Building too much negative associations towards that. So, life going on and being good and knowing yourself and knowing the world, it's maybe there's a principle there. There's a principle about life going on and having quality challenges, little challenges in some area that the next time you want, like, I, I, I don't know if you think of it as hard or uh, easy or whatever it is, but whatever level it is, it's the kind of challenge that makes you want to do it again. That's the level of difficulty. Whatever the difficulty is that makes you want to, yeah, let's do this again. Whether I succeed or fail, let's do this again. And even failing in its own right is like, cool. You know, I, I had fun nonetheless. And maybe even having fun nonetheless expands the dynamic, the range, I guess, of the possibility of that particular challenge. I'm not sure. Still a lot to learn about that, and I got a feeling that's going to be one of those questions that's never going to have a definitive answer. That is going to have so many elements of subjective reality that I really can't quantify all the variables. But I'm getting more and more comfortable with questions I can't answer, of explaining nothing. To all those that have gone before, there's an element of me that misses you. Maybe even some of the ones I don't know. To all those that are here now, there's an element of me that wants to, hopes to, do a quality job of appreciating. Maybe I say this as the agent that is myself. The, the, the person in control of most of my mind and most of my body. I still divide the mind up in some weird ways. I often like the metaphor, I don't know where I heard it, but of the conscious mind is just a small part of the mind. Like a five-year-old. And that five-year-old is controlling a really powerfully built elephant. Now, a five-year-old can control an elephant to a certain degree. And it really functions well when the five-year-old has a vested interest in going somewhere that the elephant has a vested interest in going. And maybe subjective reality is figuring out ways to convince that elf that they have a vested interest in going someplace, creating good associations, good feelings about something, and using those good feelings to influence your subconscious mind. The gentle staring of the five-year-old, because the even the hardest yank or tug on the reins of an elephant when you're a five-year-old is not gonna do much to the elephant, but that gentle guiding of the subconscious mind and me seeing myself as that five-year-old in my own conscious mind doing these things. And it all kinds of adds up in weird ways. Even having moments like this, talking about moments like this, good quality conversation. Well, is it more conversation than monologue? But still, 
having uh, I've had elements like this in good conversations, good connections with people. It's also nice to know that I can have this as a, a, a quality monologue amongst myself, still figure things out, but not have the tediousness of putting another human being through a whole my my, my thought processes. So that's nice. And it also lets me know that, hey, I can practice that fine art of listening just a little bit more, get a little bit better at that, because this has value, but this has more opportunity for me to do this, and that has value too, but that has less opportunity, because you have two agents, two people, two thinking beings, or more, getting together, and it's easier to get logically just one person together by themselves usually and then it is to get two people together in a quality conversation more variables you know as I said with the, the band and as my the other half of the band would say when someone would ask us do you guys want another member I can play bass and we always appreciated the idea that's so cool someone wanted to join us on this journey but more, as he would put it, more heads are more headaches. And circling back, this moment right here, associating this as the tailing end to a workout is making workouts more likely to happen. So this whole experiment, you know, and it's not a true scientific experiment, but this whole endeavor, I believe it's stacking up in a weird and good way, hopefully, towards a healthier love lifestyle for this person. And this agent, this idea, this thing that is me. And this thing that is me, just maybe, if I get better in all sorts of wonderful ways, I can help other agents get better in all sorts of wonderful ways. And just maybe, just maybe, we all make this world a little bit of a better place. And honestly, this might sound silly, but I believe this world is a better place than what it was. I believe 500 years ago was horrible. I believe that we have special words that indicate this. We have things that are called home invasions. That's scary, that's awful. Fortunately, it's not that common for most people, depending upon where you live and your situations. Home invasions, that's some heavy words. 500 years ago, that was Tuesday. History's a horrible place. You read about the atrocities done in war. I don't try to go too deep into that, but I definitely believe there's a part of me that needs to know just to turn up my value of appreciation of the situation I'm at. And we, I actually won't say the word need, wants to know. Because every time I, or I read something that I consider hopefully a true fact of history, and that true fact just happens to be horrible, realizing, okay, history is a horrible place. I don't have to live there. I can live in here. Focus on now, the wonderful things of now, and know that some of this now is gonna go into the future in good ways. And yes, there's always gonna be bad things. That's symptomatic of life. But this future that we're going towards, I do believe it's getting better and better. It's like, I'll take a huge and scary concept, racism. There was probably, now I'm not talking overall, but per person, averaged out value, more racism in the world per person when there wasn't a word for racism. It was just not liking different people. It might have been just such a common thing that there wasn't a word for it. It was just existence. It was just the way things were. 
you know, so many times in life we have, we deal with people with like, get with the way things are. This is just the way it is. And so many things throughout history have changed from that was the way it was. Those were different times back then. To, yeah, and there's still some things that this is the way it is. Absolutely, and there always will be. But this is the way it is now. Seems to be amazingly better than the way it was then. For everybody, in certain ways. Almost everybody. And I like that idea of high tide rising all boats. So yes, these are the little things I think about, the little things I live upon, the, the avenues my mind goes on when uh, maybe not the, the grief equation is enough. So the, that trick, uh, how do you not think about a purple elephant? Well, you think about an orange fox running around a hospital, nursing its foot because there was a small thorn in its paw and it's kind of going a little slow. And then there's a snail and the snail says, hey man, I can help you out. And the snail, because it's slow and methodical and careful, wants to be a surgeon and takes that thorn from that fox's paw and the, the, the fox licks it and thanks the snail. And the snail needs to get somewhere so crawls on the fox's back and Since the fox likes to hurry and wants to do a whole bunch of different things, but also wants to help out the snail, runs down the road to where the snail needs to be or wants to be. And they, together as a team, don't even notice the gray elephant that they just passed by. Now here's the cute thing about that story. What was the color of the elephant? Two different colors. Two different elephants, hopefully. Or one elephant that was really good at camouflage. Um, first elephant, I think it was like a purple elephant. Second one, I think was a gray one. But maybe throughout the process of the details of the story and getting lost in that thing, answering the question, how do you not think of a purple elephant you go into the gray elephant and I know people that live their lives like this involuntarily the, the what is it the, the fallacy of primacy or something like that everything that's in front of their face is the most important thing so they often lose track of the really important things and I suffer from that too but I, I know people <laughs> that like the fallacy of primacy is real and it's whatever is in front of their face. And they're always putting things in front of their face and that are uh, distracting of some sort that for whatever reason, and I, you know what, I'm not even gonna judge. Um, I know I could fall into that pit. That's, that's usually, except for recently, usually why I try to limit my Facebook usage to about five minutes a month, but and yeah, yeah, I, I, there's definitely months, there's absolute months where I fail, this being one of them. But some people really use that as communications, and you know what, that's me throwing excuses and justifications against one of my guidelines. But that's a cool thing, it's not a rule, it's just me living a guideline. Like, hey, your life would probably be better and good, or your life is better when you're only spending about five, five minutes a month on that. And in theory, the main thing that I spent five minutes a month on with it, I'm not really around anymore. It's a weird thing, a band. Especially a band of two people. You're half a band, you know? And it's a cool thing, too, because there's an amazing amount of freedom there. 
and the Valium Wars only go two ways. You know, when one person turns up, then the other person turns up, and they, you know, when you have multiple people, those Valium, Valium Wars can get really complicated. And I always thought about it like this. It was all about, for in some situations, you can have responsible people that are really enjoying the nuances, the nuances of the, the, what they're playing, the little things, the sometimes even the ghost notes or the, the slight hammer-ons or slight bends. And they can be heard, but with all the other instruments, those slight bends, those nuances don't get heard. So they turn up so they can hear the nuances. And the other person is less likely to hear their nuances. So they want to hear their little nuances. And the other person's like, oh, and... I think the the term is I think it's something like combinatorics. Uh, when you have some variables or some things changing, and the, the the more they interact is another variable, and then there's another variable on top of that, uh, and it ends up being some insanely <laughs> complicated math. Um, it's almost like the volume wars might be some sort of exercise in combinatorics. I don't know. But yeah, the band as an entity, and I've seen it. I, 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 even in bands I didn't think had value wars, there's there's sometimes a little bit of it. I remember I was hanging out with somebody, and this guy was not a good person. I know it's bad to say somebody's a bad person, somebody's a good person. Hopefully, that person turned into a good person eventually, but. Uh, I was not happy with his antics and so many things. And I'll give you a small idea of what of his small antics. That really didn't hurt too much, but it was done to please him by causing problems for other people. I was hanging out with some people, and he was one of them. Mainly for whatever reason, I got stuck hanging out most of the time with him, kind of babysitting him or whatever. Uh, I think he... Uh, his personality wore on some of the other folks that wanted him to come along, but, you know, didn't want to deal with the, uh, the, the personality that was him. So, you know, me being a, a dead mother of sorts, um, trying to take care of all the things and make sure everybody got where they needed to go and all that kind of stuff, which with some people is terribly easy and some people it's less than easy. So, spending time with him, Watch this band, and the guitarist was just louder than everybody. By like, you really couldn't hear almost anybody else in the band. You could barely hear the whole band together over this guitarist. And just, you know, arr, you know, yeah, totally involved in himself and all this kind of stuff. Basically leading the whole band, like not even caring what they're doing. Like anything they do wouldn't influence what he was doing. Not because he wasn't, could barely, could probably barely hear them, but just didn't care, you know. Um, and that's just me making probably an assumption there. I don't know. I don't know in the subjective reality what his reasons for doing the thing he was doing. But what I saw was, dude was real loud <laughs> compared to everybody else. Just over the top. And my buddy, being a jerk, and just seeing that smile he had when he was deciding to screw things up and stir things up in a bad way, talk to the band... And he's like, you guys were amazing. And he specifically talked to the guitarist. And he's like, though, I, I, I think you need to turn up. I really wasn't hearing you enough. I even believed him. And I knew what he was doing after he said it. Like, that was so convincing. You're trying to screw up these people's lives. You're picking at a pain point and trying to... Uh, exacerbate it for your own pleasure. You're on a seagull mission. You know, a seagull flies in from the sea, takes a dump on a statue, and flies back out to sea. Just totally being a seagull on that point. And, um, like, hello, <laughs> bye. You know, I just created, you know, he just, you know, he's thinking, I just created a situation for those guys to deal with. Ha 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 ha. You know, as if, you know, making other people's lives miserable really truly translates and maybe it does maybe the reason he was what he was is the only way he could feel good was you know cutting down other other people and, and uh causing problems in other people's lives which explains a lot like you know what would be even a weirder moral question would be like 
what if it wasn't his fault? Like, what if he had no choice in the matter? What if he was just wired, hardwired, no changing it whatsoever, that the only path towards happiness he had was screwing up other people's lives and causing mischief, mischief and being an agent of evil and negative chaos. What if? I don't believe that, so I believe he has culpability, but um, what if I'm wrong? And I've been wrong about so many things. So, Is it a possibility that he had no choice? Yeah, sure. But in the idea of freedom versus determinism, even if he was hardwired into that and there, there was totally deterministic, it's also totally deterministic that the rest of the world would give him his just desserts if he earned such just desserts, you know? So let's say he puts himself in a situation where, I don't know, people hurt him or something like that. Or, you know, have a choice to hurt him or not. I don't know. I really don't know what happened to him after all that. I know that, like, yeah, I'm not spending time with this person or these group of people that want a person like that in their life. Um, I'm not going to be mean about it, but I'm not going to make them choose him over me. You know, no, I'm not playing those, those political games or anything like that. It's just sometimes, you know, here's a weird thing. I think at that time, one of my primary motivations towards life was just to become a hermit. <laughs> Get in a situation where I never uh, deal with another human being ever again. Completely and utterly self-sufficient. Uh, now that idea kind of horrifies me. But I could see the, 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 the draw of it back then with uh, the way I was, my personality was, and the way it was unfolding. And it's still unfolding, but it's unfolding in a different direction. The direction it seems to be unfolding now is uh, a lot under the belief that, hey, we're all in this together. And there's some things that are maybe easy for a person to do and hard for another person to do, but there's some for that other person easy for them to do. And if you do things that are easy to help out other people, even no sacrifice, no real sacrifice involved, minimal easiness, you know, and everybody consistently does, not everybody, but let's just say to reach threshold, 31% of the population does this, follows this principle, then maybe that 31% is the threshold where the whole world gets better in a very large way. So not everybody, but, you know, not even the majority, just 31%. Of people living up the principle, hey, I'm going to do easy things to help other people out. And some knowing those, some of the easy things you do, some of the kind words you say, some of the, 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 the things that are just totally, oh my God, this is so easy for me to do. That really helps out a person. Really, really helps them out. Like knowing what those things are, figuring out those things are, kind of looking around and like, what would that thing be? And using that thing you know, that skill, that talent, that whatever it is, maybe even developing it further to help somebody else out, I think is a really cool thing for at least 31%. Like I said, it's an arbitrary number. 31% of the population to be really into. Like, that would be so cool. And maybe it already is. I don't know. Maybe it's above that. I, I don't know everybody in the world. Um, but I, I like that principle. And I see it in different forms, not exactly expressed by this, and different versions of it, but not even but. Cool. Cool. A lot of different flavors. I almost said, like, but I want my version to carry on. No, I don't. <laughs> I want the best version of that to carry on. I want an amazing version. I'm sure that there's a better version than my version out there, so... Hopefully that version carries on, and hopefully I get a piece of that version and start understanding that version even better, you know? So, yeah. Wow, a lot of talking for 15 minutes of workout, but this video is about workouts, right? Yeah, yeah. It's about accountability and all the things that stack together. You know, doing something like this, having this talk and, and getting deeper into breathing, all that kind of stuff, makes this more likely to happen. And accountability, breathing, monologues, adding these things up makes that a better experience. And better experiences, quality challenges are more likely to happen again and again. 
So hopefully I'll be working out again soon and this, that, doing that will hopefully make my life better and better and better. More consistent. Who knows, maybe one day I will figure out ways to manipulate this thing and create it in such a way that every day I want to do this. Like, wow, like every day, like so little mental resistance to it. But there's still some resistance, I'll be honest with you. There was resistance yesterday, and yesterday was supposed to be the day for this, but, you know, and I could go with excuses and justifications, but I do know, and I can identify with myself and tell myself the truth, that there were some resistances, and there were some things I could have done differently to get this done yesterday. Fortunately, still getting it done today is good. And uh, just keep going towards the good, not the perfect. As my buddy would say, progress, not perfection. I am so thankful that he taught me that, and there's a lot of good examples of in his life of that. Legs are almost asleep. That's fun. Uh, I heard somebody talking about posture, and I thought the, it was one of the coolest and most pithy type phrases. Your next position is your best position. And I'm really kind of finding that out. Like, I don't like sitting down for long times. So I don't like laying down for too long. I don't like standing for too long. But I do like switching positions. <laughs> Consistently switching positions in some goofy way ah. and maybe that is innately healthy for me in some weird way who knows and on that note and on the note of many good things and many good people man I've been trying to sign off for a while haven't I actually this has just been an hour long sign off session it's almost like on the phone where nobody, everybody, one person says bye and the other person for whatever reason says bye and the other person for whatever reason bye. Good luck, man. Cool. Later, you know, my, my, the thing I like to say is later it shall be. Um, generally, I, I like the idea of saying that and just no matter what else someone else says, unless it's something that they really need me to have a response, zip my lip, practice the fine art of being quiet and walking away because that is a definitive energy. Matter of fact, let's practice that right now. Later it shall be.